the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. That 
fall. You and I hold so cavalierly in our hand and feel absolutely lost and in my case just a little naked without was created by people following in the footsteps of Alexander Graham Bell and rethinking what was possible. That's the harder road, you know. It is far easier to rethink impossible, to look at any given problem and think of all the obstacles and potential hazards. It's easier than anything to pronounce any situation hopeless. It's easier to try to pinpoint the flaws in any idea than to actively work to see how you can make the idea better. Some people I have found, have discovered countless ways to rethink impossible and simply do not have it in their tool chest to rethink possible. I have no idea how these people get their arms around Easter. But if you're one of them, today may be your one chance to move to the point where you can see the possible in the impossible. And you should take comfort in the fact that both the women, as they walk to the tomb, and the men, as they lay in their beds, staring at the ceiling, and wondering whether they had not only wasted the last three years of their lives, but put a price on their own heads by being associated with someone who was crucified, after all, for sounding like he was trying to lead an insurrection. They were wondering whether it would be possible for them to go on. The death of, you, of someone you love will do that for you. Dr. Fred B. Craddock, the professor of preaching at Emory University wrote, following a death, there is much to do, and there is nothing to do. There is nothing to do. Nobody goes to work, nobody goes to school, nobody is hungry, nobody has anything to say. Helpers are helpless, and mostly they are in the way. Yet, there is much to do. Legal matters need attention. The body must be prepared for burial. A tomb must be located. The women knew where the tomb was, but they also knew that Joseph of Arimathea had, in his haste to get Jesus buried by sundown, only wrapped his body in a linen cloth. They were on the way to finish the job. It's the only thing they could possibly do for their friend. The only thing they expected to find at the tomb was the body of their dead friend, Jesus. What they got instead was a young man, perhaps an angel, with a very brief message. Do not be afraid. Yes, Jesus was crucified and died. His body was placed here. But it is not here now because he's been raised and is back in Galilee, and it is there that you will find him. That's it. That's the announcement that has caused Christians throughout the centuries to rethink possible. It's pretty thin stuff. And it gets even thinner when you consider the way Mark ends his gospel. The women don't run from the tomb in excitement, yelling, hallelujah, and jumping for joy. No, Mark tells us that the first reaction to the resurrection was that, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to no one because they were afraid. 
as Dr. Thomas G. Long, Dr. Craddock's successor down in Hempford, notes, not only does this verse fail to provide proper narrative closure, it also lurches to an awkward grammatical style. A more literal translation would read, to no one anything they said, afraid they were for, it is almost as if the author of Mark had been suddenly dragged away from his writing desk in mid-sentence before he could even get the words in their proper order. Is this any way to get you to rethink possible about so big a matter like the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? Easter is supposed to be full of post-resurrection appearances, joyful seaside meals, scenes of reconciliation and forgiveness, garden embraces of the risen Lord and the disciples' excited shouts, He is risen. But Mark offers us none of those, choosing instead to end his story with frightened women fleeing from the cemetery in silence. This is no way to run a resurrection. Still, Mark's Easter account is full enough of good news that you might be able to rethink possible. It comes in the words of the young man seated in the tomb. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see just as he told you. Those are the words that just might cause you to rethink possible. It's the news that Jesus is always one step ahead of you. Jesus is ahead of you, whose bodies do not work well. Bodies that need exercise. Bodies that are hungry and homeless and tortured. And the bodies of people who feel like they are nobody. He's ahead of parents who spend their days taking care of the huge demands of small children. He's in the back seat of the minivan or the SUV as you fulfill your countless errands. If you saw him ahead of you there, your errands would become holy pilgrimages, pregnant with possibilities. That's easy, by the way, for me to say I'm a single guy, I have just a dog. He's ahead of students who knock themselves out to make the grades and who stay up all night writing papers and cramming for exams. He's ahead of you when you call home and try to explain to your father and your adopted uncle that you're going to change your major and it's going to take you a fifth year of school. He's ahead of those single adults who believe that their dating life has gone AWOL. He's with them when they fall in love and make a commitment to another person. And he's with them when they have a terrible argument and say things they wish they could take back. He's ahead of those who drive to the office. He's waiting for you at the office. He knows all about your boring business meeting because he was there in the conference room. He is with you when you trudge home, exhausted at the end of the day, only to comfort another long list of duties. He's ahead of you in every problem you face. That's the good news of Easter. Wherever you are going, Christ is already there. Rethink the possibilities in that proposition. The secret to living in the ordinary is to see every second full of God through whom all things are possible. The secret of rethinking possible isn't much of a secret at all. It is there in plain sight. The risen Savior is with you on Easter Day, 
and every day. And all you have to do to experience the joy is to say, Jesus, come here. I want to see you. And he'll be there before you get the words out of your mouth, helping you to rethink possible. Thanks for listening. Now, go and enjoy all the possibilities that life in the resurrected Christ has to offer. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.